Vivaldi was born in 1678 in the city of Venice. Today, tourists flock to Venice to see the canals, the bridges, the squares, of course, the restaurants and the theatres. All of this is pretty much like it was really in Vivaldi's day. Between the 13th and 17th centuries, Venice had amassed vast power and wealth, although its influence was rapidly fading by the 18th century, as the Republic was no longer a major centre of international trade. Now Venice instead became known as the place for leisure and pleasure. The European Grand Tour reached its peak in the 1700s, and Venice was considered a must-see destination for aristocratic travellers, and one of the best places in Europe for gambling, partying, and having a great time with the local courtesans. Many British travellers planned their travels to Venice to coincide with the most decadent time of all, the Venetian Carnival. This period is often symbolised by gilded palazzos along the Grand Canal, lavish fashions, elaborate parties, elegant cafes, mask-wearing anonymity and loose morals. But it was also the period that gave birth to great Venetian painters, such as Tiepolo, Canaletto, Guardi and Longhi, and of course, not to forget musicians such as Antonio Vivaldi. It's kind of surprising that for such a great composer there's very little that we know about his biography. We do know that he was born on the 4th of March in 1678 and he was obviously considered to be in mortal danger when he was born because the midwife baptised him at home on the spot. Indeed the priest, when Vivaldi was actually baptised officially in church two months later, the priest wrote that being in danger of death, Vivaldi was given the water, i.e. baptised at home by the midwife. Certainly Vivaldi suffered from poor health for much of his life. Tightness of the chest, what the Venetians termed as trattezza di petto. Although it's very difficult to categorically say what this was in terms of modern medicine, it seems fairly likely that it was some sort of asthma Vivaldi was part of a pretty large family. There was uh, a girl who had been born two years previously, but she died shortly after Vivaldi was born. And after Vivaldi was born, there were about another eight siblings that were born to Vivaldi's mother and father, Camilla and Giovanni Battista Vivaldi. Vivaldi's dad is famous for having worked as a barber. He also worked as a pretty hot fiddle player, violinist, if you like. And it's, this is quite interesting because it does seem that, particularly in Venice, the professions of uh, barber and musician did go together somewhat. The Venetian music scene was, was, was absolutely colossal. There was music going on in all number of churches, concerts in the palaces. There were various theatres that put on thriving operatic seasons. All in all, if you were a musician living in late 17th century Venice, that was a pretty good time to earn a living. One of Giovanni's jobs was playing in the orchestra of the Basilica of San Marco, the biggest and most famous church in the whole of Venice. What's interesting for, about Giovanni Battista is that he seemed to be a little bit of a hothead earlier in his life. And in fact, he was chucked into prison for having assaulted the son of a nonsolo, or a type of assistant priest. I'm guessing that that wouldn't uh, particularly endear you to the authorities. But it's quite interesting that this sort of passionate temperament of Giovanni Battista may well have been passed down to Antonio himself. Vivaldi was probably taught the violin by his father, maybe even by Giuseppe Torelli, but... Who did he study composition with? This is a pretty tricky question to answer because there's absolutely nothing to go on here. But if you look at the large collection of Vivaldi's manuscripts, his personal collection of manuscripts, you can find a good number of 
sacred vocal pieces by an anonymous composer written during the 1690s, so probably before Vivaldi had started work as a composer. And on account of the fact that we don't know who this guy was, um, he has been given the nickname Composer X. And if you're wondering what Composer X's music sounded like, well, you're in luck because we were wondering that in about... 15, 16 years ago, and we recorded a setting of the psalm Laudate Puri. Here's a bit of music by Composer X. For noble families, it was often the second son who was sent off to become a priest. But uh, for families like Vivaldi's, it was quite common to send your oldest son to join the priesthood uh, because this gave him, and therefore the family, the prospect of climbing the social ladder. Vivaldi started training for the priesthood in 1693 and became eventually fully ordained in 1703 at the age of 25. We all know that he subsequently gained the nickname Il Prete Rosso, or the Red Priest, on account of uh, the red hair, which was probably a family trait. One of the other popular legends that has survived the years about Vivaldi is that shortly after uh, becoming fully ordained as a priest, he decided that he wasn't going to celebrate Mass on account of his ill health. A couple of ways that I that I look at this. One is that if it's too taxing on one's health to say Mass, then how do you go around travelling Europe, putting on operas, playing concertos, teaching the violin? I mean, surely that is more uh, taxing on one's health than, than saying a simple Mass. Having said that, however, for those people that think, oh, obviously Vivaldi wasn't a particularly good priest, there are accounts that tend to refute this. One very interesting account is given by the Venetian playwright Carlo Goldoni, who turns up at Vivaldi's house and asks to see the operatic libretto that Goldoni is supposed to be working on. And uh, Vivaldi responds... By saying, Where is Griselda gone to? It was here. Deus in agitorium meum intende domine, 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 domine. Ah, it was here this very instant. Ah, domine in adjuvandum me. Carlo Goldoni paints it as the sort of ramblings of a mad priest, but it does suggest that there was, a, there was at least a streak of devotion to the church in Antonio Vivaldi. <laughs> So in September 1703, Vivaldi, at the age of 25, became maestro di violino, or violin master, at the Ospedale della Pietà in Venice. More about this institution later, but this was an astute appointment by the Pietà, because while Vivaldi is most famous today as a composer, He was back then regarded as an exceptionally technically gifted violinist as well. Just imagine what it would be like listening to Vivaldi play this concerto. (laughs) 
was part of the Concerto for the Feast of the Holy Tongue of St. Anthony of Padua, a concerto that Vivaldi wrote for himself to play in 1712. For details about this recording and all the other recordings used in this podcast, uh, you will find a full list on the website. One German visitor to Venice, a guy called Johann Friedrich Armand von Uffenbach, he heard Vivaldi play a concerto such as this one, and he was pretty gobsmacked by Vivaldi's audacity and technique, all the technical wizardry that Vivaldi was able to pull out of the violin. And in his memoirs, he wrote that towards the end, Vivaldi played a solo accompaniment, splendid, to which he appended a cadenza, which really frightened me, for such playing has never been, nor can be. He brought his fingers up to only a straw's distance from the bridge, leaving no room for the bow, and that on all four strings, with imitations and incredible speed. And what Offenbach gives with one hand, he then takes away, because at the end he then says, With this he astounded everyone, but I cannot say that it pleased me, for it was not so pleasant to listen to as it was skilfully executed. We could have a whole new podcast about critics, couldn't we? But... uh, There you go. There are a few cadenzas that survive by Vivaldi along the lines that Uffenbach describes. Here's a bit of the hardest of the lot. We've already mentioned how Vivaldi was only 25 when he started working at the Ospedale della Pietà. Over the next 30-odd years, he composed many major works whilst working there. The Pietà, however, was, was actually one of four such institutions in Venice, all financed by funds provided by the Venetian public. And this is where we are going to dispel one of the myths that I hear pretty much every day about Vivaldi, and that the Pietà was an orphanage. It was not an orphanage. The Pietà was a foundling institution. And if you felt that you were unable to bring up your child, you could deposit the baby so long as the baby could fit through a hole in a wall the hole in the wall is actually still there today you can go and see it but if you could fit your child through this hole in the wall you could leave safe in the knowledge uh, that the pieta would look after your child and and raise it the boys learned a trade and had to leave when they reached the age of 15 to pursue that trade but the girls a select few of the girls were chosen to receive a musical education where they would be taught an instrument and how to sing by people like Vivaldi and also some of the senior members of the musical establishment there. And they would go on to perform with the orchestra and choir of the Pietà. Vivaldi supplied the Pietà with concertos and sacred vocal music. In 1713, the then maestro di coro, Gasparini, was uh, granted sick leave 
And uh, this was a sick leave from which Gasparini never returned. Not because he died, but because, well, he just decided never to go back. So the Pietà found themselves short of a Maestro di Coro. So who did they turn to? They turned to Vivaldi, who supplied sacred music for the next four years, albeit only on a temporary basis. He, he was never actually given the job. And then in 1723, the Pietà decided that they needed more concertos for their orchestra. Not just more concertos, but many more concertos. And the Board of Governors at the Pietà passed a motion whereby Vivaldi should be paid to supply the Pietà with two concertos every month in the event that Vivaldi is not in Venice to to hand his homework in personally. Vivaldi is to bear the cost of the postage himself. But if Vivaldi is in Venice, then the Pietà expected each concerto to be rehearsed at least three or four times. The orchestra at the Pietà was relatively unusual for an orchestra at this time. Orchestras in Italy were predominantly filled by string players. You did find the occasional trumpet player, the occasional oboist. The Pietà was unusual in that the women of the Pietà, in addition to the standard string instruments of the orchestra, played mandolin, arch lute, theorbo, of course the harpsichord and the organ. Then when you get to the wind instruments, we know they played the recorder, the flute, the chalamo, which is like a slightly early predecessor of the clarinet, to put it simply. They played the clarinet as well. In fact, the earliest instance of a clarinet featuring in an orchestral situation is in Vivaldi's oratorio, Udita Triumphans, written for the Pietà. And of course, the o- they played the oboe as well. So it must have been an incredibly colourful sound world that the women inhabited. And Vivaldi, as his concerto scorings and his sacred music show, clearly revelled in the opportunities that he was presented with when writing for these exotic instruments. To give you a bit of a flavour of the Shalamo, here is a short extract from a setting of an easy dominus. We've already touched on the fiery temper of Giovanni Battista Vivaldi and how this may have been inherited by Antonio. It's interesting when you look at the employment history of Vivaldi at the Pietà, you will notice that he seems to be constantly being voted in and back out of office. So he must have been pushing somebody's buttons. On the other hand, there's a very interesting anecdote which shows Vivaldi as a benign and protective colleague there's an account given in uh, Johann Georg Pizendel's biography. Pizendel went and studied the violin with Vivaldi in 1716 and 1717. And there's a story where Pizendel is walking with Vivaldi through the Piazza San Marco, and Vivaldi suddenly says, you've got to come back to my house with me now. So Pizendel has no idea what's going on, goes back with Vivaldi. Vivaldi goes out and comes back half an hour later, says, it's all right. I noticed that some members of the secret police were tailing you and uh, I wanted to find out what that was all about, but it's OK because they're they're looking for somebody who looks a bit like you but actually isn't you, so you've got nothing to worry about. That's Vivaldi going above and beyond to make sure that his, that his pupil's all right, which is rather touching. It does also bear the question, how does Vivaldi know the secret police so well? But I'm sure... That is a question to which we will never know the answer. Vivaldi's first real public breakthrough as a composer came with the publication of his Lestro a Monaco, 12 concertos featuring solo parts for one, two, 
four violins, sometimes also with an obbligato cello part. And these works were dedicated to the Grand Prince Ferdinando de Medici. The prince sponsored many musicians, including Scarlatti and Handel. He was a musician himself, and Vivaldi probably met him in Venice. Lester and Monaco went on to become one of the biggest-selling collections of concertos in the 18th century. Such was its success. It's fair to say that Vivaldi has had his fair amount of critics over the years. One famous criticism is that he's composed the same concerto 400 times. In actual fact, if you actually look at how he progresses as a composer from the early years of Leicester or Monaco through to the 1730s, you will actually see that he is anything but a composer that has composed the same concerto 400 times. Of course, as with a lot of Vivaldi, when you stick some Vivaldi on the radio, whatever, within sort of two and a half seconds, you go, oh yeah, that's, that's Vivaldi. It's so catchy. But, I mean, just look at the violin technique that he uses. Lestra and Monaco, the concerto in B minor that we've just heard a little bit of, if you were able to play fast notes and you were able to play high in the high register on the violin a bit like the cadenza from the concerto from Padua we heard earlier. For early Vivaldi, that's pretty much all you need to be able to do. Fast forward 20 years, and the violin techniques that Vivaldi is then using in the 1730s, it is a completely different universe. You look at how he has developed the technique of the bow in the, in the previous 20 years, and he goes from... In, in 1711 with Leicester and Monaco, just being able to play lots of quick notes, very fast, suddenly you're being asked to have complete control of the bow in the cantabile sections. You're asked to play fast passage work, as found in Leicester and Monaco. You are being asked to play using a technique known as up-bow or down-bow staccato. And amazingly, what appears towards the end of the concerto RV211, Vivaldi actually introduces what I can only think is a ricochet bow stroke. Even Tartini, who was the sort of king of the bow stroke, who was, you know, 20 years younger than Vivaldi, even Tartini, I cannot think of any instances of ricochet in Tartini. So to say Vivaldi wrote the same concerto 400 times, I think is, is grossly unfair. Another criticism brought against Vivaldi is that sometimes his music is harmonically unadventurous. It's true, some of his concertos are rather simplistic in their harmonic outlook, but he was also more than capable of mixing it with the best harmonists of the period. Not only that, but sometimes his harmonies are so bizarre it's like they've landed from a different century. Here's an example of a slow movement from another violin concerto, this time the concerto in E minor, RV 278. Is this weird or what? 
then as now, composers had to work to deadlines and Vivaldi would often find himself with a huge number of compositional jobs on the go at the same time. It was therefore in Vivaldi's own interests to be able to compose rather quickly. Uh, This is uh, something that he himself was rather proud of. Often people say it's uh, quality, not quantity, that we should go for, but I think he, he managed to get quality and quantity. He said he was able to compose a concerto faster than the copyist could copy out the instrumental parts. Then... Again, if you look at his opera Tito Manlio, which is a huge opera, over four hours of music, the front page of the autograph manuscript says, music by Vivaldi, written in five days. I mean, that that is some doing. Vivaldi was also pragmatic wherever possible. If he thought he could get away with a short piece, then he probably would. Why compose a 16-minute violin concerto when you can submit a concerto that lasts a bare four minutes, such as this concerto Alla Rustica. Vivaldi was always very conscious of the occasions for which he was composing. For instance, if you take his sole surviving oratorio, Udita Triumphans, Vivaldi goes all out to impress, bearing in mind this is a work for the Pietà, celebrating the victory of the Venetian Republic over the Turks. He gets every single instrument that he can out of the of the Pietà's store cupboard and writes an obbligato, so you get a sort of procession of strange instruments, a bit like the musical Noah's Ark. He was also completely at home and able to be structurally innovative with much smaller pieces. For instance, the setting for soprano, violin and strings of the Salvia Regina. Here you almost get a, a mash-up of a sacred antiphon and violin concerto. <laughs> Although today we remember Vivaldi primarily for his concertos, if you'd have asked him back then, he'd have probably said that he was involved in the business of opera. Opera in early 18th century Venice was by far the most popular musical entertainment, and its singers were, I suppose, the equivalent of pop stars. Certainly some of them were paid obscene amounts of money, much more than any of the musicians or even the composers. Several theatres competed for the public's attention, and so you can imagine that Vivaldi, as a young and enthusiastic composer, 
would have had his eye to the main chance, wondered whether he could make a pile of money composing operas for the Venetian theatres, although he was well aware that it was not without its risks. In 1714, he became the impresario of the Teatro San Angelo in Venice, where his new opera, Orlando Finto Pazzo, bombed. The mid-1710s saw the first bumper crop of Vivaldi operas, and one of these was a piece called Arsilda Regina di Ponto. And this was an opera with which Vivaldi had great success. The most important singers in Vivaldi's day were those who would sing the parts of the prima donna and the primo uomo, i.e. the leading lady and the leading man. The role of the leading man would normally be sung by a castrato. As the name suggests, a castrato was a man who had been castrated, selected before their voices broke, boys would undergo an operation in the hope that they would go on to achieve fame and untold wealth on the operatic stage. Every opera that Vivaldi wrote included roles for a castrato or castrati. Nowadays, of course, this practice has uh, long since gone out of fashion um, and now we rely on women or the occasional countertenor who can sing very high to sing these roles. But... Just have a listen to this aria from Vivaldi's Mottezuma. This was an aria with a trumpet obligato that was written for the castrato Marianino Nicolini. With Vivaldi's time spent increasingly away from Venice working on operatic projects in Mantua towards the end of the 1710s, Vivaldi became acquainted with an aspiring young singer, Anna Giraud, who was to become his student, protégé and favourite prima donna. Anna, along with her older half-sister Paulina, became part of Vivaldi's entourage and regularly accompanied him on his many travels. There was much speculation about the nature of Vivaldi and Giraud's relationship, but no actual evidence to indicate anything beyond friendship and, and professional collaboration. And Vivaldi was a priest, after all. Our previous acquaintance, Carlo Goldoni, actually had something to say about Anna Giraud, and, as usual, He's rather catty in his remarks. He starts. <laughs> 
This ecclesiastic, i.e. Vivaldi, who was an excellent performer on the violin and an indifferent composer, had trained and instructed in singing Miss Giraud, a young singer born at Venice, but the daughter of a French hairdresser. She was not pretty, but graceful. Her shape was elegant, her eyes and hair were beautiful, and her mouth charming. She had very little voice, but a great deal of action. She was to represent the character of Griselda. One wonders whether Vivaldi and Anna Giraud's musical collaboration was made easier because they both shared hairdressers as parents. Of course, no podcast about the music of Antonio Vivaldi would be complete without at least briefly mentioning the Four Seasons. These four violin concertos in particular, Spring, have gone on to become some of the most recognisable classical music of today. What makes these concertos stand out from Vivaldi's other 396 is that Vivaldi composes them in a programmatic way. That is, he tells a story through these concertos. The music has titles interspersed at various points, telling the performer what is happening, and Vivaldi also provides a sonnet, probably written by himself, um, for each concerto. Despite coming from a city of canals, Vivaldi would surely have spent enough time travelling the roads of Italy by coach to get to his various opera houses in order to become acquainted with the sounds of nature and rustic life. The subjects addressed in these concertos are often subjects that you will also find in his operatic arias, such as singing birds. Lamenting shepherds storms drunkards hunting parties from both the hunters and the prey's point of view there are frozen landscapes Ice skaters. One of the most perplexing things about the career of Antonio Vivaldi is that he had very little fixed employment. OK, Vivaldi had his jobs providing concertos and what have you to the Pietà. He also had a stint for about two years in Mantua, but other than that, his career seems to resemble more that of a modern freelancing musician than that of a Baroque composer. This doesn't necessarily mean, however, that Vivaldi didn't harbour ambitions. Indeed, he, particularly in his later life, seemed to harbour some pretty lofty ambitions. And We know that he had several attempts at communicating with the Emperor Charles VI. Vivaldi would have loved to have had a post at the imperial court in Vienna. Indeed, in 1728, Vivaldi met with the emperor whilst the emperor was visiting Trieste to oversee the construction of a new port. Charles admired the music of Vivaldi so much that he is said to have spoken more with the composer during their one meeting than he spoke to his ministers in over two years. He gave Vivaldi the title of knight, a gold medal, and an invitation to Vienna. Vivaldi in return gave Charles a manuscript copy of concertos entitled La Cetra, and then soon afterwards dedicated a published set of concertos also titled La Cetra. From this publication, we're going to hear the first movement 
of a concerto for two violins in B-flat. Whether Vivaldi would have made a success at the imperial court or not, we will never know. After he left Venice for the final time in order to go to Vienna, the Emperor Charles VI died. Vivaldi probably had many reasons for leaving Venice. His compositions were no longer held in such high esteem as they once were. Changing musical tastes quickly made them outmoded, especially in such a fashion orientated place. We could also surmise that Vivaldi may have outstayed his welcome. In response, Vivaldi chose to sell off sizable numbers of his manuscripts at paltry prices to finance his move to Vienna. It is likely that Vivaldi went to Vienna in order to stage his operas, especially as he took up residence near one of the opera theatres. But with the death of Charles VI, Vivaldi's income dried up, he fell on hard times, became ill and soon afterwards died on the 28th of July, 1741. He is said to have died from an internal inflammation. On the same day, he was buried in a simple grave in a burial ground owned by the Public Hospital Fund. The cost of his funeral was 19 guilders, 45 kreutzer, rather expensive for a burial with just the lowest class of a peal of bells. Almost as soon as Vivaldi was buried in Vienna, his music passed from public memory. Even a work such as The Four Seasons did not satisfy the insatiable appetite for new music. It wasn't until the early part of the 19th century when Mendelssohn started reviving some of Bach's major works that Vivaldi stood any chance of making a comeback. The reason for this is that Bach himself had transcribed several concertos by Vivaldi, some for harpsichord or harpsichords and some for organ. And by the end of the 19th century, certain musicologists became sufficiently interested in the music of Vivaldi that they started delving into some of the European archives. Biographical material about the composer, however, remained scarce, and as such, Vivaldi still sort of maintained an air of mystery. This suited, in particular, Fritz Kreisler, who composed a concerto for violin and at least initially passed it off as a concerto by Vivaldi himself. As you'll hear, however, it may be a nice piece of music, but it really doesn't sound like The Red Priest. <laughs> That concerto by Fritz Kreisler was written round about 1905 and whilst it might sound nothing really like a Vivaldi concerto, it did inspire a young French violinist and musicologist, Marc Panchal, into dedicating his life to the study of the music of Vivaldi. This was really just the beginning. The meagre number of Vivaldi's manuscripts that survived in the early 20th century was soon to be vastly increased by two huge discoveries made in the 1920s, representing Vivaldi's own personal manuscript collection. The University of Turin purchased a collection of 14 volumes from a monastery in Monferrato, whilst a further 13 volumes were purchased from a descendant of the Count Giacomo Durazzo, 
who had bought the collection shortly after Vivaldi's death. This treasure trove of Vivaldi contained no fewer than 300 concertos, 19 operas, 100 vocal and instrumental works, including the sole surviving oratorio, Udita Triumphans. Whilst we don't expect another discovery of this magnitude to be made, the prospect of, if you like, perpetual discovery of works by Vivaldi seems to be very much still alive. Indeed, scarcely a year passes without a work popping up somewhere around the world. Only last year, myself and La Serenissima were rather fortunate to be the first people to record a recently discovered concerto for violin in F major. Have a listen to this, see what you think, and thanks for listening. Thank you.